to him who loved us and washed our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be eternal glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord which forms a portion for our sermon text this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Luke chapter 10 starting at verse 38. As they went on their way, Jesus came into a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who was sitting at the Lord's feet and was listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her serving. She came over and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered and told her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. In fact, Mary has chosen that better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Mercy, grace, and peace are yours through your God and Father and through your Savior from sin, Jesus Christ, your fellow redeemed. Do you get distracted sometimes? Well, if you're like me, the answer to that question is no. I don't get distracted sometimes. Rather, I get distracted all the time. There are more distractions today than ever, it seems. When I looked up the meaning of that word, distractions, there were two definitions that I got. Number one, having attention diverted. Seems like a pretty standard definition. And then the second one was this, rendered incapable of behaving, reacting, etc., in a normal manner, as by worry, remorse, or the like, irrational, disturbed. I thought that second definition was interesting, a much more complex and complete definition. But as I analyzed the different definitions in my brain, I realized that I was simply having my attention diverted from my sermon study. As I said, I get distracted all the time. Distractions are not always bad per se. There are such things as welcomed distractions. Sometimes it can be good to have your attention diverted. But I suppose it really depends on what your attention was on in the first place. If you are focused on something positive, something important, well then you wouldn't want to have your attention diverted from that. Then on the other hand, if you were focused on something negative, something that you could not control, then of course you would want your attention diverted from that. This then begs a question, and it's a question that our text today, this morning, answers. What should we focus on? What should hold our attention? Jesus really simplifies it here for us. He said, one thing is needed. He doesn't actually come out and say what that one thing is, but we know exactly what he is talking about through the gift of faith. That one thing that is needed is qualified as something which will not be taken away. Therefore, let us do here today what Mary did that day so many years ago. Let us all come down and sit at Jesus' feet. Don't get distracted. Leave all anxiety and care behind you. Instead, focus on what Mary focused on, that is, the better part, and hear Jesus' word. And so we pray. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Maker and Redeemer. Amen. As they went on their way, Jesus came into a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. It's a pretty standard description here by Luke of what was going on. Of course, we know much more about where this was and who this was. We know that this certain village was Bethany, which is located two miles away from Jerusalem. We also know more about this family from other accounts in Scripture. There was Martha, the oldest sister, Mary, 
and then their brother Lazarus, who is not mentioned here in our text, but would be a central figure in another one. What's remarkable about this event is that it wasn't really normal. That is, it wasn't really normal at the time. No rabbi would go to a house of a woman, or even a man for that instance, to teach them. Rather, it worked the opposite way. You would seek out a rabbi and learn from him. But of course, Jesus didn't follow such traditions as this. A house call was not out of the ordinary for Jesus Christ. He would often visit and stay with all sorts of people. As Jesus would explain it later, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It was not lost on Martha just how important this was. We are not told explicitly how many people exactly attended this event, this meal, but presumably it was Jesus and the twelve, if not more than twelve. Martha knew that it would be on her to get her house ready, to serve these people a meal, and to serve the Savior and whoever else is with him. This, no doubt, caused Martha to feel a great amount of anxiety and pressure. What are your practices when company comes over? I always remember how my family would act when we had guests. I remember myself and my other siblings always groaning when company was coming over. It's not that we were antisocial or anything like that. But we were always commanded to clean our rooms and clean the whole house whenever company was over. No matter how familiar that company was, we'd have to do the same thing. I remember pleading one time, but mom, it's only so-and-so. They don't care how clean our house is. That often fell on deaf ears. If only so-and-so would warrant a clean room and a house, how much more so with the prospect of the Holy Lamb of God visiting? You could see why Martha would be anxious in this situation. But how did her sister Mary handle this event? She had a sister named Mary who was sitting at the Lord's feet and was listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her serving. I think what makes this text so relatable and so identifiable is how we can easily go into Martha's shoes here. She was the older sister, and she took this householding as her responsibility. To her point of view, her sister here wasn't doing anything. She was just sitting there at Jesus' feet listening to him. Why wasn't she helping out? Why was it fair that Martha had to do all the work herself? Isn't her complaint here to Jesus pretty valid? After all, it would be a lot to host and feed presumably over a dozen people here. Wouldn't we act in a similar way? So, what does Martha do here? Well, she tattletales. She came over and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Again, if you grew up with siblings, you would know about tattletelling. It's, one of the, it's when the one child rats out the other to the parent. The one doing the telling, from their perspective, of course, is innocently simply informing the parent about facts that they should be made aware of. But of course, there's always more to it than just that. Have you ever acted like this to your parent and then instead got reprimanded yourself? Seems rather unfair. After all, they were the ones who were doing something wrong. I only just spoke up about it. Why should we get in trouble for simply reporting? But really, it is, of course, an attempt to justify ourselves and make our brothers or our sisters look bad. Who did wrong in this situation? Was Martha's service wrong? No. Was Mary's quiet reflection on the words of Jesus wrong? No. Neither one was doing anything 
wrong. But of course, Jesus sees past just the actions and can see into the heart. His view of the simple of the situation went beyond simple actions. He could see the hearts here of both the sisters. His correction of Martha will show this fact. The Lord answered and told her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. You can see here the loving correction of the Savior by simply calling Martha's name out twice. He says her name repeatedly to correct her in loving admonition here. By the second Martha, she could probably see where this was headed. The fact of the matter is that Martha was relatably distracted. Jesus told her that she was upset. She was worried about many different things. And to compare that, there is only one thing that is needful. That word here in our text, distracted with all her serving, literally translated means dragged down. I think that's a very apt description when it comes to our various distractions. They're weights. They drag us down. They weigh us down. They slow us down. There's all kinds of distractions out there, of course. Our attention spans are ever growing shorter and shorter. It's so easy to become weighed down with the minutiae of the things that don't matter. Things can distract us like our jobs, our relationships, even our mission to make us make disciples of all the nations can distract us from the one thing needful. When it comes to Martha here, I think of that second definition of that word, distracted. Rendered incapable of behaving in a normal manner as by worry. What was Martha's crime here? Well, nothing that she did. Her problem was her attitude. She was serving her Lord. This, of course, is admirable. It should be commended. But her mistake was supposing that her serving was more important than the one whom she was serving. Martha made the mistake of thinking that she was the host and Jesus was her guest. What is the one thing that Jesus is talking about here? What is that one thing needed? It comes in many different forms, many different titles. In this case, it is the very same words of rebuke that were coming out of the mouth of Jesus. Quite simply, it's the word of God. He, here, Jesus, was the word of God incarnate at the very same house of Martha, and she couldn't focus on him. Instead of listening to Jesus and his words, Martha was dragged down by other distractions, cares, and anxieties. I think this is very relatable because we ourselves find ourselves in similar situations. We prioritize other things ahead of hearing God's word, studying it in our lives. We might try to defend ourselves in these situations. Aren't we simply doing the good, the work that we're supposed to do? Isn't it good to take care of earthly things? Well, of course, yes, it is good to do these things at times. Earthly cares and concerns are never to predominate the word of God. Take time for the word first and foremost. Then go about your worldly cares and duties. That's why we go to church on Sunday. It's literally the first thing we do each week. Get the one thing needful first. Then we can proceed to do the work, the extra work that is ahead of us. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. In fact, Mary has chosen that better part, which will not be taken away from her. Here Jesus kind of uses a play on words, if you will. He says that Mary, who was preparing different parts or portions of a meal, was choosing the wrong part or the wrong portion. Jesus is already doling out the portions here of the bread of life. Another childhood memory, I guess, that I have is that of portions. 
It'd be some item of food that both either I or my sister or my brother would want, but of course only one of us could get it. So as a compromise, we would decide that we would split it. How would he do that? Well, one child would decide that he would split it. The other child would decide which part to choose. It's kind of a fair way really when you think about it because it incentivizes both, both decisions. If you split it crookedly, then the one who's going to choose it is going to choose the larger one. So what about the other sibling here? Don't get any of Mary's words here. She doesn't speak in this text. Instead, we simply see her getting the word, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Is Jesus and his word ever a distraction? Well, I suppose it can be. But if it is, it is a very welcome distraction indeed. He is the most welcome distraction from the things that are going on in our world, in our environment. We can become so distracted and stressed out over the random things that happen in this life, the things that get reported on the news. But when we do this, we are distracted from the things that truly matter, from our purpose of what we're truly even doing here. Getting distracted from, by the world is not a good thing. Get distracted from the world and focus on the word. Last week in Bible class, we talked about the sower and the seed, found two chapters previous to our text here. There, Jesus lays out the importance of the word. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. That's the summary of that parable. That whole parable, of course, describes the importance of the word of God. It can be snatched out of hearts by the devil. Roots can be tempted by, or tested by temptation. It can be choked out by the cares and anxieties of this very same world. But to those who treasure the word and keep it in their hearts, it's something that produces fruit. It's something that cannot be taken away. It is easy to become distracted, and it's hard to remember that there's only one thing necessary. There's only one place where we find that which we truly, in the fullest sense of the word, need. And that place is at the feet of Jesus. On that day, there, it was at that house of Mary and Martha. Today, it's found here, in God's house. When we go home, it goes with us. We can find it in our bedsides, on our coffee tables, even on our cell phones. The word is always with us. And when it is in us, it can be never taken away from us. And that is what we should truly focus our attention on. The sisters' relationships here shaped Martha's narrative. She couldn't get past the fact that she was working hard while her sister seemingly wasn't. But Mary's relationship with her Savior defined her narrative. She knew that whatever she had going on in her life could wait. It was not as important as what Jesus was going to say there that day. Here was the Savior. What else mattered? Think about the implications of what Jesus says here about the word. Mary has chosen that better part which will not be taken away from her. That really is true. Think about it. What can be taken away from us? Everything. Our families, our jobs, our freedom, our possessions. Well, at least you have your health. Nope, that can be taken away too. All these things are subject to loss. There's only one thing that can never be taken away from us. It is the word. The word of God and the security that it provides us. In the word, we see the truth. We see that we are sinners. We see that we have eternal death headed our way as a consequence. But then we see the word, namely Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word. He was God in human flesh. 
He came to this earth to seek and to save that which was lost, namely, you and me. He did so by going to the cross, dying in our place. Because of that fact of faith which we find in the word, our place in heaven is eternally secured. Even though we are sinners, we know from the word we're going to heaven. This can never be taken away from us. Shouldn't it then always have priority, top priority in our lives? The world still spins, of course. Well, it does, no doubt. There'll be other things that pop up seemingly out of, out of nowhere that require your attention. We'll always have different responsibilities, different cares that occupy our lives. Even before the fall into sin, Adam himself was a gardener. But our responsibilities and cares and work is always secondary. They are always secondary to our main concern, our main problem, which has already been solved. Martha had many concerns and cares that day, and so, so do we too here today. But before we face them, our biggest care is a spiritual care. Your cares are always taken care of by Jesus and his word. Let Jesus serve you first. Then after that, do all things to his glory. There are many different things that we can focus on. Many things which require our attention. But know how important we might deem them to be. There's always something else that should be our chief concern. It's the word. It is that better portion or part. It is that everlasting word of God, and, it is, and in it is found an answer to every problem we could ever have. Now that we have addressed the problem, now that Jesus has addressed our problem, we can go on into other things, but never lose focus of what's really important. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Cares and concerns, they come and go into and out of our lives. But our primary care is already taken care of. Our sin is paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us always then be quick to hunker down back at the feet of the Savior. Martha asked Jesus here, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Jesus does care. He cares for your soul, and he will never neglect it. He has saved your soul from hell, delivers it into heaven. All praise and thanks be to Jesus Christ, that word made flesh, the one thing needful. Amen. Please rise.